most of us were there to find a solution, to work with the medical profession, to talk about what sort of advice doctors could provide to their patients um, about ensuring that they drove safely. Uh, the police kept coming forward with a what if hypothetical scenario. What if someone, we stopped someone, they tested positive and they showed us their medicinal cannabis card or prescription and then they went off and had an accident and someone died. Um, we couldn't live with ourselves. We can never let that happen. There was also this presumption and it's, a, it's an awful, awful presumption and stigma around medicinal cannabis patients that somehow these patients are really tricking the system and that they're actually going to have bongs for breakfast um, and then pretend that they've, they've got some, that pretend um, that they've got some a, a illness and pretend that they've got symptoms that qualify them for medicinal cannabis. So sadly, this is where it is because I, you know, like you, David, you speak to politicians. I know Mick does. I know Tom does. Teresa does. When you speak to them one to one, they all know someone. They all know a patient. They all know someone that medicinal cannabis has helped. But we, you know, we just hit this barrier. And I, you know, I in in my case in Victoria, I am hopeful that we will have a brave government that just says no. This is the right thing to do. We can find the safe way to do it. Tom's work, all, all of the work, and we can get this changed. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful before the end of the year. Thank you. Mick, did you want to comment on that as well? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind saying a couple of things, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind, David. Uh, I think, uh, in my experience, uh, Fiona, the, the police attitude varies from location to location. In my recent, well, two things, two examples I can, I can give. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we're working with Lucy Haslam uh, at her first symposium, actually, in Tamworth, when Dan, her son, was still alive. Uh, at that time, as you might remember, Mike Baird, the then Premier of uh, New South Wales, actually met with young Dan, uh, saw firsthand the suffering he was going through, listened firsthand to the stories of the relief that he was obtaining from not medicinal cannabis, but cannabis for medicinal purposes acquired from illegal sources. Local police officers, including the local area commander, were totally supportive of the family in purchasing that, made no step, attempts to stop them, understood it, were aware of it, informed the commissioner, who is uh, Andrew Scipioni, of it, uh, and they made no attempts to get in the way of it. So I thought that was quite a mature ex mm -hmm. exercise of discretion in a, in a real life situation. Mike Baird's experience, I think, fundamentally changed his mind and he became a, a real advocate for change and for the uh, implementation of medicinal cannabis laws. And in Queensland, I've had some recent dealings with uh, senior police in Queensland. They have really uh, have surprised me really with the, the positive attitude they have, not only to medicinal cannabis and drink driving laws, uh, drug driving laws, but also to uh, illicit drugs more generally and the need for change to the current uh, you know, tough on drugs, criminalisation policy. So there are a, a range of attitudes. Uh, I think it's a terrible shame if, if that's the attitude Fiona and Victoria yeah. please have because they've got to take the time to Can I just make a provision that, Mick, you're absolutely right. And I, and I do not mean to lump all police into the same position. Um, but, you know, when we, it was an assistant commissioner that we were working with. And I think, you know, as we know, that police can be very risk averse in these areas. Um, very much. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and so it, you know, in fact, she spoke about her father-in-law having, um, using medicinal cannabis and the benefits that he got from that. So she yeah. wasn't opposed to say to medicinal cannabis, but they couldn't get their heads across how they could allow medicinal cannabis patients to drive while not allowing rec adult use without yeah. a prescription cannabis users to, to not drive. I think that those that those are the certainly the problems. I mean, my own view for what it's worth is that we shouldn't be asking the police. I mean, we don't ask the judges. We don't ask. Uh, we don't ask a whole range of people. And um, uh, I mean, police views, of course, should be taken into account, but they shouldn't be the be all and end all. And in effect, they have a veto. Yeah. In any event, uh, Tom, I think the next question is going to be for you and then Teresa, um, and that is probably the most popular question we've had tonight which is about are there better ways to test um, for impairment other than random drug tests? Uh, if, if the big bar to uh, um, change is 
well, how can we distinguish between detection at non-affected level and detection at affected level, then what, what's the research on this, Tom? I mean, testing for impairments are really, it's a difficult thing and no one really has the answer to this at the moment. And a lot of countries are, are in a similar situation. I mean, most countries don't have random roadside drug testing, but they're dealing with, with uh, increasing medical cannabis use and this issue of how do we uh, measure that? So, I, you know, in the States, for example, um, standardized field sobriety testing is still the dominant approach. So if you're weaving, you look like you're um, driving impaired, there's, there's plumes of cannabis smoke trailing out of your car, uh, you'll be pulled over, um, police may make you, you know, things like walking in a straight line, touching your finger to your, to your nose, um, balance tests. Uh, these things are, they, they're all calibrated to alcohol and they're, they're actually very sensitive to alcohol intoxication. They're okay with cannabis. Uh, they're not perfect, uh, but they're okay. And they're certainly, at least from my point of view, better uh, than having a simple uh, presence offense. So in most of those cases, if someone did fail one of those tests, then they would have to provide a blood sample. And in a lot of US states, uh, and, and in a lot of other countries as well, there are still per se laws in blood. So if you have more than a certain amount of THC present in your blood, uh, then, then you can be charged with an offense. Um, but I, I think no one, no one really has the answer to this. To me, that's a, a better situation than what we have here. I think an alternative might be to, uh, to have something like that and then use something like oral fluid testing as a tool for confirmation. So not simply just to see whether someone is uh, positive or negative, but if there is evidence that someone is already impaired, then something like oral fluid testing might be a good way to go. Well, what drug is that likely due to? And then that leads on to, uh, you know, whether that's blood testing or, or whatever the process that police might normally follow. So I, I don't think uh, anyone really has the answer to this. Some people are, are toying around with this idea of a cannabis breathalyzer at the moment. I know there's a couple of companies that are vying to, to get something out on the market. Uh, whether that's really going to be any better than oral fluid testing, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the issue with oral fluid testing is that it's just detecting residual uh, THC that's stuck in your mouth, essentially, from, from consuming cannabis. Uh, so whether breathalyzers are really any better, whether that's just uh, detecting recent cannabis use that's being actually exhaled uh, in your breath, uh, we, we don't really know yet. So, I, I mean, the short answer to that is, uh, the approach we have here is certainly not a very fair one, but I think no one really has uh, a particularly good system uh, for us to look to in part because it's, it's a very new problem, medical cannabis. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Teresa, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, uh, we uh, basically know much, Tom said it all, but uh, we know that the level of THC in the system doesn't necessarily correspond to the level of impairment. And among many patients, I've seen patients who are taking anything between 10 to 20 different medications, different opioids, benzodiazepines, and they commented they were much more impaired while taking cocktail of these heavy drugs. And their alertness and ability to drive better has actually improved while taking cannabis. So it's, um, not, uh, it's not an easy answer, but uh, even just doing a uh, simple impairment tests such as, you know, the, uh, heel to toe or touch your nose and so on. And I know, and I know that that's what is happening in New Zealand, that you have the impairment test first before going to, to other tests. Plus, uh, they are so-called fast and uh, slow metabolizers. Everyone is different due to genetic variabilities in hepatic metabolic pathways. Some, some people will eliminate uh, THC very quickly from the system, whereas for some, it will stay longer. Apart from that, as, as we all mentioned before, uh, cannabis is uh, fat soluble and for medicinal cannabis patient, um, it will probably be detectable all the time because they, they take the medication on a regular basis. And I am probably a bit naive here, but we have so much technology. Why can't we have some kind of simple computer games that could be presented to a patient just two, three minute test, some kind of um, you know, technologic feeling that uh, they could score points whether or not they are impaired. So I'm sure that there would be better ways of uh, addressing the problem that currently are. Can I just add something there? Uh, so there is this app, which many of you may have heard of, this Druid app, uh, which has is, is got quite a bit of hype about it at the moment as well. This has been developed by uh, Michael Milburn in, in the States. Uh, and there's, there's quite a bit of testing going on uh, with this at the moment, and we're incorporating it into several of the trials uh, that we're currently running. Uh, part of the issue with this is uh, 
how do you measure someone's performance relative to their baseline? If, if people just get a score when you test them, how do you know what score that person would, would normally have? So it's how we actually implement something like this, I, I think is, is actually quite complicated, but there's certainly, um, you know, I, I suppose some a reason to think that something like this, you know, if you could give people a test that could be conducted in two or three minutes, which is as long as it takes to, to, to read an oral fluid drug test anyway, that would give you a measure of functional impairment, uh, th then obviously that, that would be a much better solution than what we currently have. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tom. We, we, we don't ask this question about benzodiazepines. We don't ask this question about opioids. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we rely on the doctors to, and the patients and we trust the patient who is on benzodiazepines or on opioids that we say, you won't drive if you're not feeling up to it. And in fact, that's what it says on the packet. You know, don't drive if you're feeling impaired. And our doctors provide them with the risk assessments and all of, and all of those um, risk trees and risk analysis and all of that. But we don't, for every other prescription drug, we, we, we're we not asking this question. And I, I, I get, I, yeah, I frustrate because I think we can, this question, we could be spending years and years and years trying to find this solution and those years will be medicinal cannabis patients either, or patients not choosing cannabis because of these restrictions. Yeah, for, for myself, I think that an appropriate approach, particularly given Tom's research, would be to say um, uh, that you're not to drive within four hours of taking your medication. That way people could take their medication before they go to bed at night. They could then um, would be waiting way over four hours and provided that you took your medication in accordance with your prescription and the directions of your doctor, then you'd have a defense to the offense because that way uh, it, uh, no one's really worried about the, uh, the, um, the test any longer. So in any event, uh, I think we've covered some, some ground on that. It's a thorny problem. And I think we're really lucky that people like Tom uh, are putting their mind to this and, and doing some good, solid, hard research. Um, the, um, uh, of course, at the moment, we just have that total blanket approach. And Fiona's right. We don't have that for any other drugs. So, uh, sorry, any other uh, um, uh, prescription drugs. Um, so. Uh, there's some further questions, and I, I think that they're important. Um, uh, and I, I might open this one to Mick first. Uh, Mick, to what extent is this really about um, prohibition, as opposed to having anything to do with road safety? Well, I think it's it's underpinned by the fact of you know prohibition and, and our obsession with the, the current tough on drugs policy, if you like. Uh, I, I think it is driven by road safety. I mean, we do have a bad road safety. Uh, record in this country. We lose a lot of people on the roads in circumstances in which they shouldn't die. And there's a reason why people are very concerned about that. And I, so I understand that they'd want to be tough on any, any threat of, you know, further impairment to our driving skills on the road. I think that's the, that's the basic thinking behind it. And I do think that's what drives police more than just the prohibition policy, but certainly even at the police and certainly the government level, prohibition gets in our way all the time in terms of it trying to make any sort of inroads into the current state of play, uh, no matter how many facts you're able to table and how many, uh, uh, how much evidence you can provide of the fact that what we've now got is is badly broken and isn't isn't achieving any of the results that we set for ourselves, it's not achieving any of the outcomes that we we really laid down, uh, and is not minimising harm in any sense at all. And here's a classic example in terms of medicinal cannabis, where it's of course aggravating harms, as Fiona just said, in so many ways. I think it's driven by the fear. Uh, and by the, the, the you know, the, the fear of being seen or in any sense going weak on a, on a road uh, death problem that is serious and a road toll problem that's a very serious one. Uh, without people being prepared to dig even one inch below the surface to look at the sort of issues that certainly Tom and Teresa have talked about now and the, the reality of uh, what we all know that, you know, the taking of the drug, there is no sign of impairment in, in almost all of the, uh, the apprehensions that occur. And there's simply the fact of the presence of a drug that is leading to the person securing a, a criminal conviction. Uh, to anybody who takes any time looking at that, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, but I think as Tom said, I, I think until we can come up with a, a test that gives people some confidence, and I think it sounds like we're getting a long way down that track, which I think is, is very important. Uh, that we can assess, uh, no matter whether I have a, pres a prescription or not, we can assess 
to some extent my, the reality of my impairment. Probably we're going to have some difficulty in changing the law at the moment. You know, it's the, what what Fiona said about the police attitude. If they let them go and have a crash down the road, you know, how am I going to feel? I mean, uh, that tends to be how police officers think. And I can give you a thousand reasons in terms of how many times we do do that and, and a crime takes place down the road and we don't stop exercising discretion. Of course, you can't be sure of the outcome of any discretion you exercise. And so the argument, in a sense, is really a silly one. But it's not if you're not at the same time, it's it's a concerned one. Uh, they are worried about that. Uh, that's driving their thinking. Uh, with a test like uh, Tom has outlined and Teresa has touched on, uh, you know, I think uh, that would give people a lot more comfort and confidence uh, to move forward. At the moment, I think it's a case of uh, it's illegal, therefore you can't do it. I mean, that, that's where prohibition, I think, is the underpinning uh, problem here, David. Uh, this drug is an illegal drug, therefore you shouldn't have it in your system, so therefore you can't drive. Uh, Which... Where that the, and of course we know that it's not an illegal drug in the sense that uh, prescription works. Yes. Um, the um, next question uh, relates to modes of ingestion. Um, of course, I think there's smoking, vaping, uh, eating, tablets. Um, uh, is there a difference uh, in terms of both detection and affectation? Tom? Yes, there's a big difference in terms of detection. Uh, you only have THC in your oral fluid if you consume cannabis in such a way that it actually comes into contact with your mouth. If you vape it, if you smoke it, if you eat it as an edible, if you drop an oil under your tongue, uh, all of those methods will lead to THC being present in your in the oral fluid or your saliva. If you ingest it as a capsule and there's no THC that actually physically touches your mouth, uh, you won't have any THC in your oral fluid, very simply. You'll have it in your blood, but not in your oral fluid. So it doesn't transfer from blood into oral fluid. So whatever you have in your mouth is really just contamination from when you've actually consumed it. So yeah, there's a big difference. In terms of how it affects you, uh, I mean, th that's quite a complicated question, but um, THC, we talk about pharmacokinetics, which is really the movement of the drug through the body and how it's metabolized and, and eliminated. And, and there's big differences in the way you consume it. If you smoke cannabis or vaporize it, you get a, a very a rapid peak in blood THC levels. So you get very high levels within a couple of minutes of smoking or vaping, uh, any way that you inhale it. And then it begins to drop off very quickly after that. If you ingest it orally and it's absorbed through your gut, uh, then it can take about an hour or two to reach its the highest levels or, or maximum concentrations in your blood. And then it plateaus there for the next three or four hours or so and begins uh, to drop off. The thing is, there's, there's actually a huge difference in the maximum concentrations you might have depending on how you consume it. So for example, if you consumed uh, two and a half milligrams of THC, uh, by vaping, and then you consume 50 milligrams of THC, so a far higher dose uh, by ingesting it, you would probably still have a higher um, peak, so the highest level of blood THC after you'd smoked it or vaped it than if you had eaten it. So you get these, it's kind of sort of difficult, I suppose, to, to put in, um, in in a simple uh, analogy, but but the short is, is that, yeah, there's, there's huge differences, uh, and the amount of THC you have in your system varies uh, enormously as a function of how you've consumed it, irrespective of how much THC is actually in your brain uh, or how impaired you might actually be. So why then aren't prescribers putting it into capsules rather than um, tincture or, or uh, other forms? W would it not be better for drug driving purposes for people to be utilizing capsules? Uh, it would be better for drug driving purposes, but I'm not sure that's most physicians' aim is to give people the, the medicine that's best for their uh, drug driving purposes. Uh, you know, often it, it comes down to differences in, in bioavailability, uh, absorption. Um, for some people, uh, I mean, for example, if you take vape, inhalation, vaping, um, the effects come on much more quickly. So for someone that really needs instant pain relief, that's going to generally be far more effective um, than swallowing a capsule. It's also much easier to titrate the dose. So you can have uh, one or two inhalations, see how you're feeling, have another one if you need. If you've swallowed a capsule, it might be two hours before uh, you realize that that dose of THC was actually a bit more than you intended to have. And obviously, if you're doing this over time under medical supervision, you, you figure that all out. Um, but there's reasons why you might prefer to use 
uh, an, an oil that you drop under your tongue or uh, a vaporized product over uh, a capsule. Thanks for that. Therese, did you want to add to that? I want to as clinician, we prefer to start with the oil because it allows us very slow and gentle titration. So, because patients are very sensitive and there are quite a significant variabilities. Some people may require quite a bit of THC and some may be okay with very, very minute doses. So capsule tend to have a, the same dose. So it's a 20, 50 milligram or whatever it is. But when you have the oil, you can start very gently with the most minute dose and move it up uh, to so-called sweet spot where we have the most optimal therapeutic effect and no or minimal adverse effects. So once the dose is established, then I would, sorry, I just, then I would be comfortable uh, putting patients on capsule, but I really prefer oils. And for vaporization, we prefer to use this uh, as to um, control breakthrough symptoms. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question, and I think this will at least start with Fiona, is um, Fiona, the, um, what, what can people best do to seek to change laws that th they find so impairing on their, their lives? I think, um, I think Mick really showed the way there and, and well, and Lucy Haslam um, showed the way there that it was those personal stories that 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 affected change. And I know here in Victoria, it was the stories of young children with intractable epilepsy that swayed um, Daniel Andrews, our premier, to, to to make the move to move towards legalising medicinal cannabis and setting up a regime for medicinal cannabis. So it is those personal stories, and you know, every medicinal cannabis patient is a voter and politicians, despite how they behave, actually like voters or they want voters to like them. They don't, they don't, sometimes they don't behave like that's what they're looking for. Um, but it is those personal stories. It is the effects and the impacts that cannabis has on you. And I used a story of a fellow, a young fellow who had um, epilepsy and he wasn't able to drive because of his epilepsy. After a period of time on medicinal cannabis, he had no seizures for over six months. So this young man, for the first time in his life, was able to drive, was able to pursue, well, what he had hoped was he was able to go to college. But because of the prohibition on him um, driving or the fear that he would 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 get caught on a on a positive test. He was back at square one, even though he was now epilepsy free. So those personal stories to our um, to your local member do have an effect. They do have an effect, and you ask them to to lobby for you. You ask them to advocate for you. And I, 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 yeah. I you know, we all love um, sprinkling our speeches with the stories that personal stories and, 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 and analogies. And I, I think it's really important that people hear from you. I think it's really, I really agree with you there. You know, what, what really moved me, I used to wish that on list days at Lismore Local Court, that the politicians would just come in and see the personal story because it is, it was just absolutely tragic. I mean, people yeah. could see their whole lives falling mm -hmm. apart they were going to lose their jobs their ability to take their kids to music lessons their ability to do contact with their estranged family uh really the lifestyle for people particularly in rural and regional areas uh without a license can just be dreadful and i was taking about 50 people a week's license away from them and every one of those was a personal story of tragedy yeah. um so yes I, I mean i think that that and I do think the National Party has a big place to pay here because rural and regional people are doubly hit hard by this. I know that many people in the city still need their licence, but in the country, it's absolutely crucial. Yeah. And um, uh, people lose their jobs, they lose their houses. I know it's a, it's a slight aside, but let's not forget that the overdose rate in Australia is double the road. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget that the people on opioids, the people on benzodiazepines are at risk of overdose. And we know, and I'm sure Teresa would know, and I'm sure many of the people on this, on this um, call would know of people who've chosen to stick with those far more um, 
dangerous medicines because they are able to drive. And you know, I, I think this is a great tragedy. And if we're trying to reduce, if we're trying to reduce the to death toll, um, uh, accidental death toll, then getting people off benzodiazepines, getting people off opioids would 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 assist in that. Well, that's right. After these people. Yeah. Uh, so please. I want to add that data in Australia shows that um, out of all deaths due to overdose, 80% is caused by legally prescribed drugs, benzodiazepines, opioids. And we created a worldwide opioid, opioid epidemics. Whereas I don't believe we hear a uh, medicinal cannabis patient or any cannabis patients uh, overdosing on, on cannabis. So this is quite a significant issue. Opioids, benzodiazepines are killing people. And yep. if we, we have a better option and we are limiting the people at the same time, that just, to me, there's no compassion. It's really quite cruel. I was speaking to a GP who prescribes here on the North Coast and he was saying 50% of people come in, he assesses them, he prescribes, and then he tells them about the driving and they never fill their prescription because... They simply, uh, you know, you know, they, they will go back to using their alcohol or their or their pain relief drugs rather than um, medicinal cannabis. Oh, the um, treatment is not optimized because they are just sticking to CBD, and most of the time we all need a bit of THC and, and other components of the of the plant. So basically, patients, because of the law on driving, are not receiving the optimal treatment. Yep. Thank you. Um, we're about to have um, CBD over the counter um, uh, and that will be able to have up to 1% THC. Tom, have there been any studies at all about whether that could be a detectable use? We, we don't really know this yet. I think this is going to be a really, uh, a really interesting <laughs> uh, space to watch. Uh, we're not really sure. Uh, there's been some work with uh, vaporized products so so in a lot of european countries they're allowed to sell a light cannabis which i think has is allowed to have up to 0.2 percent thc and there's cases where people have uh, well over the, the detection limit for thc here in their saliva after vaping those products now of course here we're talking about uh, oils um, i have seen some uh, some evidence that uh, using CBD products with very small amounts of THC uh, can produce certainly detectable concentrations of THC uh, in blood and in, in saliva. Um, whether that will be enough to trigger uh, false positives on roadside drug tests, not sure, uh, but that's a very interesting question and something that uh, we're trying to look into uh, in, in some of our future research at Swinburne. Okay. Sorry, I meant to go back to you, Mick, and ask you about um, uh, what you thought people could do most, what's the most important thing people can do to try and get change? Well, I think Fiona's right. I think it's, it's got to be a combination, I think, of uh, finding every mechanism we can, looking for every mechanism we can to uh, give people a better understanding of the reality of the facts, but combining facts with scenarios or anecdotal evidence. I mean, uh, it is, it's very true to say, I think that, uh, you know, facts tell and stories sell. Uh, and unless we find ways to personalize, uh, and in all my experience in any of these issues of conflict, uh, going back to the, uh, the, the gun laws uh, in John Howard's day, when we started, you know, to get tough on drug and guns and so on, it was only with the telling of the stories of what sort of the damp with the damage that was being caused by our current laws and why they needed to be changed and why people didn't need to have the guns they believe they needed to have uh, that you could start to sway people who otherwise thought uh, the whole idea of change was stupid uh, and i think the reality is and this is a very good example because of course when you're talking to people with uh, children as so many of these cases are with the these crippling diseases that we know were medicinal cannabis can be so helpful for, uh, and the various forms of dreadful epilepsy, uh, it, it tugs at every person's heartstrings. So, I mean, we've got powerful, powerful information there, powerful stories to tell there. I don't think we can win just on the stories. I think it's got to be a combination of the facts, you know, where Thomas is coming from and Teresa and, and those stories, but a combination that really puts meat on the bone and that personalizes it for people. Uh, you know, I remember being at a Rotary Club just recently, not long ago, and uh, we're telling stories about homeless children, disabled, uh, disadvantaged children who were just not only homeless, but basically defenceless and in a hopeless situation. And we're in the main, we're obviously on drugs and we're sniffing, sniffing petrol and the like and, and uh, you know, and drugs and uh, other other you know, components and so on from 
from spray cans. Uh, and it was only when somebody in the audience came up with a story about his own son's son, his grandson, uh, that the, 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 the whole room changed. Everybody knew him, they respected him, they liked him. And he told this story, he said, Mick's right. He said, look, I can tell you about young Johnny. Then he told this terrible story about what had happened to Johnny. Uh, and uh, this one story did what 40 minutes of talking to me hadn't looked like doing. And I mean, it, it is the reality. And I think we just need to feed off that as what you say, what Fiona said about, you know, politicians like voters. Uh, and the reason why they're so defensive about this is really because they believe most people don't want to see change. But the, if we can create an environment where it's clear that 51% of the people think change isn't a bad idea, and all of the surveys that are being conducted show those figures are going up all the time. And in some cases, I just see in regard to criminal decriminalisation, for example, in some of the electorates in New South Wales, their figures are up at 80 and 90% in support of change. Well, that was unheard of a few years ago. You would never have got that in any electorate. Uh, so... I think that's an important part of the equation, but so we need to we need to continue to get the message out in the way we are now. We need other people to do that as well, and we need to tell those stories that show the facts support the reality that what we've got doesn't work and isn't necessary, isn't necessary, and isn't dealing with impairment or increasing the danger on the roads. And the stories that will tell people why this is so damn important that the the, the penalty far outweighs right ways the crime. What you were saying, David, about your experience, and you know, like. The punishment just has no relationship to the crime these people have committed. It far, far outweighs it. I think I think that's a really good point. People have been asking on the chat line and in the questions before, what are the penalties? And of course, they vary from state to state. But essentially, um, and probably the worst is Victoria, where there is no discretion for the court for someone to keep their licence, even if it's a first offence, even if it's medicinal even if they've got a prescription, even if they desperately need their license for work. So Victoria has perhaps the most narrow laws. So Tom, you're in the right place. And of course, Fiona, so are you. Um, but um, in New South Wales, at least, uh, my experience now representing people charged with these offences is that the magistrates just roll their eyes when people come in with a prescription. And indeed, recently, I had a magistrate directly speak to the prosecutor in open court and say, well, why are you prosecuting these matters where someone has a prescription and there's no affectation and there's no accident or collision? Um, and of course, that's that's the that's the right question. And we, we are trying to uh, approach the DPP uh, to to simply not prosecute these matters. But yeah, it's slow going. Now, um, people have asked. Oh, there's more. So many questions. There's at least at least 100 questions. I do want to say. Um, uh, where, what should you do? Uh, the other question that's been asked very much uh, just on the legal side is what should you do if you get dealt with for drink driving? And the short answer is um, that you do need to get legal advice. Um, there is uh, no legal service set up for this. You're not going to get legal aid for it. And the reason for that is because it doesn't lead to jail. Um, but uh, obviously there's, there's huge consequences for people and they desperately need legal advice. Community legal centres can provide first instance advice. The Nimbin Hemp Embassy does as well. Um, uh, but we at Drive Change uh, get completely overwhelmed with questions and we generally refer people as best we can to lawyers in their local area. Um, uh, the, and representing yourself, of course, is, is also uh, an option if it comes to that. Um, the uh, uh, is there any other uh, comments? We've got about five minutes left, and I wanted to wrap up by giving each of the uh, panellists just an opportunity to uh, give some finishing off comments. Teresa? Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. I have uh, sort of wanted to voice the, um, a, a, the voice of a patient as a doctor and, and a clinician as well. And I'm really hoping uh, for the change for the better, for, for the sake for all of us involved. Thank you. Um, I, I should say we are going to do a blog with the um, uh, with uh, to answer any of the outstanding questions that we haven't got to. So if you go to the go to the Drive Change blog website over the next few days, we'll work our way through the questions. Um, obviously, there's a lot. Uh, there's well over three hundred. So um, uh, some of them will be doubles. I'm sure. I hope. Um, uh, Tom, finishing off comments. Uh, I suppose I'd just like to say thank you for, for having me on here as well. And, and I'll probably also give a shameless plug for some of our 
uh, research at the moment because we, we do need participants. We currently have a, a detection study at the moment, which is looking at exactly how long after consuming medical cannabis you're likely to test positive with a roadside drug test for. Uh, I, I actually saw a comment pop up in the chat before where someone linked to, uh, to, to the study, but I can send something out uh, afterwards. Um, and I'm also getting started a study next year, a big study which is going to run for a couple of years, where we're going to track a new patient's for three months as they start using medical cannabis. So we're actually trying to find people before they start treatment and then follow them and track them every month and see if we see any changes in driving, cognitive performance. This can be in chronic pain patients. Um, so, so please do keep an eye out for the work we're doing at Swinburne. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you all very much for, for, for being involved. And you know, this was, we've come a long way in five or six years since that first uh, United in Compassion Symposium at Tamworth. So I think that shows you that things uh, do change for the better and, and hopefully uh, rationality uh, will prevail at the end of the day. Thank you, Mick. Tom's quite right. We have come a long way and I think we do need to remind ourselves about that. I mean, it is a journey of many steps and it's going to be an incremental change process, I think, unless something dramatic happens in the scientific world is going to give people a level of confidence they don't have. But I think we just need to, to, to persevere, to keep uh, sending out the message in the way we're talking about today that we really you know, don't lose our, our uh, endeavour and our fever for that, uh, our fervour for that, uh, that we, you know, try to build that evidence uh, cache that Thomas is talking about. Uh, but at the same time, we tell as many stories of the reality. And when I talked about penalties, David, as I wasn't just as well thinking about the formal penalties, but the penalties like you talked about, uh, mm -hmm. the fellow who lost his business because he could no longer get insurance cover because uh, of the conviction, or not even a conviction in some cases. And there's lots of those cases, you know, can't travel to other countries and can't do this and can't do that. If you were going to join, I remember defending a couple of people in uh, Queensland in my short time at the bar, uh, one of whom was uh, had applied to be a teacher and was just waiting for final acceptance, having been told he had the job, and another one was uh, applying for the Defence Force, both of whom would, would have failed had they been convicted of simple use and possession of cannabis. Just a party on a beach in a beach hut, neighbours complained about the noise, police arrived, usual thing, bongs and cannabis seized, but the penalties were going to far outweigh the crime. Uh, had they been convicted, luckily they avoided conviction, but uh, you know, the, and that's that's the reality here. And I think we need to get those messages across. The more people, uh, and we need to start aiming at the unconverted. Uh, no use patting ourselves on the back and talking to people like I guess most of the audience here tonight are people who believe in what we're saying and where we want to go. And that's great, but we need to get this message to people who think it's uh, a lot of nonsense. Because yep. the more they listen to what we have to say, the less of them I think will think it's a lot of nonsense. Thank you. Fiona. Uh, thanks, David, and, and thank you, everyone. And it's it's been great to be part of this panel. And um, yeah, I, I I do agree that we we have actually come a long way. And I I think look, in one of the latest um, household drug surveys, you know, seventy to eighty percent of Australians, I think was the number, are very supportive of the availability of medicinal cannabis in Australia. Now, if you imagine back to when, you know many of the warriors who are, who are watching today started this campaign, there was nothing like that, the support. So we won, you know, we've in, we will win this war, and I, but it is we need to, to keep telling those stories. We need to keep educating people. I love that line that facts sell, facts tell and stories sell. I think that's, that's just terrific. And so you've got Tom here, you know, providing us with the facts. Um, I, on a little note, just thinking about Victoria, uh, there's, there's been a push to actually even further strengthen the drug driving laws down here. And there is a further push to make them even harsher. And even if they could be any more rigid, more rigid. And in some ways, maybe that's the opportunity that that's where we get to carve, we, that's where we get to carve out medicinal cannabis as part of, of that. Not that I actually want to see our um, drug driving laws become more rigid because they they affect so many people in and the as they say the 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 time doesn't you know doesn't fit the crime but again thanks everyone and thanks for all the work of so many of you uh, over the many years yeah thanks to our panelists I, I've been told to say that we are going to be introducing through drive change a letter writing campaign and uh, which will be launching shortly through Drive Change, and that's a start. And I would also 
co uh, uh, comment that there is hope. We know when I first started practicing law, I represented people charged with homosexuality, yes. with uh, blasphemy, with prostitution, um, uh, and of course, in all and, in my wheelhouse. <laughs> all, 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 of course, I didn't represent you, but um, and of course, you know, in in all states but New South Wales now, it's actually legal to 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 kill yourself. Um, so uh, not while you're having a joint, though. But so the point is that there is change, uh, and we will win this. We will win this battle, and I think we will win it by those stories and really taking it on. If every one of those hundred thousand medicinal prescription patients wrote to their local members um, and, say, and to their local papers or CC'd their local papers in, I think, we, and posted it on Facebook, I really think we would see change far more rapidly. But I, I do want to acknowledge all the people who've participated. There's so many questions and that's wonderful and engaged. And I know that out there, there are a lot of people suffering. They're suffering because they can't use the medicine of their choice. They're suffering because they're driving in fear. They're suffering because they're frightened for their families and their livelihoods. And they're frightened because they're every day facing a choice of, will I use the medicine that makes me feel good or better? Or, and will I risk, um, will I risk my insurance? Will I risk all of this? Um, so I, I do want to acknowledge that. Um, and I, I would like to very much thank the panelists, each of you, Mick, Teresa, Tom, Fiona, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and to B, who's behind the scenes, and Tom, uh, the other Tom, uh, for organising uh, this. So do go to drivechange.com and have a look. Uh, we are a little over time, but uh, I really would like to thank everybody for their participation and look out for the answers to the questions on the blog. Uh, from very rainy Coffs Harbour, it's good night from me. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you.